This is the seed to house panel. Um, and while they are getting ready to come up here, which you can make yourself comfortable, I just want to give a shout out to uh, our gold sponsor, Hemp Magazine. Uh, let's give Hemp Magazine a round of applause. In my opinion, Hemp Magazine is one of the most comprehensive, well-written, well-produced magazines out there catering to the hemp space. Uh, there's a number of copies out there uh, made available, so make sure you check out their table, connect with them. Um, and we've got our crew here. So our moderator for today is Whitney Page. Um, it's an honor to have Whitney here. Whitney is uh, an enthusiastic, passionate hemp advocate. I met Whitney uh, at our Highland Hemp House building project, uh, I guess two years ago at this point. Uh, we had a workshop, Whitney came out there. And one thing that kind of struck me about Whitney was that Whitney was working in construction at the time, which is awesome. It's an amazing thing to have. We need more women in construction. And so you do many other things aside from frame houses. Uh, she currently owns a coffee shop on Orcas Island. Um, but thank you, Whitney, for being here and let you take it away. My pleasure. Thanks, Maddie. Welcome. Um, so this is going to be for all of you that have spent a long time studying hempcrete, reading the technical side. This is a panel to kind of take a break from that. And we were discussing in the back that hopefully we can address some of those bottlenecks because that's what we're all here for today. So um, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves and, you know, just kind of say your name and why you're here, um, starting with Matt. Um, my name is Matt Gershader. And I live in Haley, Idaho, right here, catch him. Um, and I'm on this panel because uh, I run Idaho Base Camp. It's a nonprofit organization. And we run outdoor adventure education programs for kids. And we have a wilderness retreat facility about 29 miles that way over Trail Creek Summit. Um, and this property is, um, well, it's home of the first public hemp building in the United States, and um, maybe now the second public hemp building. So we have two hemp buildings up there, one that's under construction, um, and then one that has been, we started building it in 2014, so it's up and running. That's great. That's why I'm, I'm a homeowner, kind of. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, I'm Chad York. I'm with Colorado Mill Equipment, and uh, we special we manufacture here in Colorado um, milling equipment, so hammer mills, pellet mills, coolers, screeners. Um, we have a lot of partners, and we've set up a lot of facilities across the country and in Canada to get the plant uh, processed into the hands of whoever's buying it, however they want it. So, um, yeah, I'm here today just to. Uh, I was really excited about this conference. We've been I think at the end of the year, we'll have done 26 conferences or trade shows this year, and mainly it's CBD and cannabis focused, and that's great and all, but I, I really have a heart for the building side of things, and I, I just know that's going to be much more impactful, but CBD is also important. And people are asking me, well, what do we do with our byproduct, and that's why I'm here to figure that out. I couldn't agree more. I was thinking that during the, um, the new school presentation, how we can take as much CBD as you want, but if your home is toxic, like. Uh. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Bob. My name is Bob Escher. I'm an architect from Dorset, Vermont. I've been practicing for 30 years now. Dorset is sort of a smaller version of Ketchum. It's a resort area in southern Vermont where Bromley Magic Stratton is. And so we have an interesting connection here, but we got a lot more trees on the mountains, that's for sure. <laughs> my, my journey's been um, pretty amazing. And I have to give 100% credit to my son, Alex, who said to me about four years ago, hey, Dad, have you ever thought about building anything with hempcrete? No, why would I do that? You know, I've, I've been doing second homes for people. I've done big houses, little houses. I even renovated a double wide trailer. I've done commercial work, but hemp, you know what? Ready? Can you smoke it? <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to um, learn about it. He convinced me to do it. So we went out to Colorado to NOCO, 
learned about it. And that's where we met. Um, and for those who don't know, what is NOCO? Oh, NOCO is the Northern Colorado Hemp Convention. Okay. I'm not sure if I got that all right, but it's the big one that's been going on, run by Morris Beagle and Company. And we met two people. One was Kelly Thornton from Left Hand Hemp and Eric McGee, who is part of the audience here today. And fate put us together because Kelly was going to start a class at Eric's house in suburban Denver. And Eric wanted to build a workshop at a hemp creek. The three of us got together, and we decided we were going to do a 16 by 20 post and beam hempcrete structure, and went through all the process of zoning, which I'll probably talk about later. But the, the key thing that happened, and what was pretty cool, what Alex said in the very beginning of the discussion today, it might have even been the first sentence. He said, I think this is a historic event. And it gave me goosebumps, because I'll never forget, someone came up to me after we'd finished the building, there was sort of a party, because Eric, if you know Eric, he loves parties. And you know, to promote our building, it, it's been a focus. But someone came up to me and said, this is a historic building. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But no, it's a little 16 by 20 shed. And I've been doing this for 30 years. I've done a lot of sheds. But thank you, but no. But it was. It really was. And, it's taken me in three and a half years, and my son, and Eric, to where we are today. And I'm blown away by an auditorium full of people mm -hmm. on this. And the best part is I was elected the president of the United States Hemp Building Association back in the beginning of the summer. And with Maddie and Tommy and our crew, you know, this is where we're at right now. Maddie and Tommy have done this incredible presentation, this incredible expo. You know, to them, thank you. And, and what it's done is it's brought a lot of people a long distance. And I think it's the best part is that we're in Idaho, which is far away. Nobody would want to think about it. But you guys are hardcore. Yes. OK. <laughs> and because. Um, yeah. I haven't even had a chance to meet Tom because he came from, did you come from far away? He Denver. just got here, Denver. so I'm yeah. dying to know. Tom, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Tom mm -hmm. Dermody. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Development for International Hemp Solutions, PBC, a Denver-based company focused on offering the essential services within the emerging industrial hemp industry here in the U.S., uh, most people know us by our seed company, Bija Hemp, which is also Colorado-based, focused exclusively on offering AOSCA certified seed here in the U.S., but we also have a presence in Europe because our licensing agreements with European seed banks allows us to operate concurrently there as well. Um, so we multiply uh, Pol in Poland, Germany, and within Colorado presently. And uh, our focus is, again, finding standardization in seed and then looking at what other bottlenecks we can address internally or through partnership. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Paracha. I am uh, a co-founder and CEO of American Harvest. And uh, we are a large scale, industrial scale processing and extraction company located in Sydney, Montana. Uh, we have uh, developed a harvesting system that allows us to harvest the crop on an agricultural scale and allows us to separate each part of the plant. And what we did is combine our technology to manufacture uh, all, the, all the streams of uh, the plant into finished products. So what we've, we've got is a zero waste technology. Uh, we have set up a facility that allows us to scale production uh, reduce costs for raw materials that would allow uh, the hemp industry to grow, not only from the CBD side, which we are doing today uh, with running four extraction lines, uh, but in addition to that, we've got a full plant utilization model where we've got the grain as well as the fiber. And so it's our intention to bring lower costs, get this to mainstream, um, a mainstream production, and, uh, and bring uh, important things to the market. 
Um, so Matt, I wanted to ask you first, since this is Seed to Home, um, mm -hmm. what's been your personal experience, and for the people that aren't going to be able to join us tomorrow, because we are going to be touring his facility at the base camp, um, how would you describe the experience of operating out of being in the Hempcrete building? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Paint me a picture. Please. Yeah, paint me a picture. Um, I think, you know, now that the, the building is complete, um, it, it, it feels good. You know I mean, I've been in a number of homes and buildings, and uh, in this one, there's just something about the feeling of it. Uh, we have radiant heat floors, and so uh, as a building itself, and it's a passive solar design, it, it, you, know, you walk in, you're like, oh, it just kind of has this dense warm feeling to it. Um, How did the I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a unique building. B building with hemp itself, with its thick walls and its natural lime uh, plaster, uh, it just is inviting to, to be in. Um, I know that there was, there was a labor of love that went into it, and in our building technique, we used a technique that was had never been done before, I believe, instead of, uh, what would you call it, Bob, the, the bucket? Bucket brigade. Bucket brigade? Yes. Yeah. We built our, our walls, we framed them out on the ground, and then we filled everything on the ground like that with a bucket brigade. We actually just kind of poured it in. And then with a crane, we, we, we stood them all up, um, and then we let them cure for about a year nine months or 10 months. Um, so not many people know like what went into it, uh, but I think, I don't know, just walking into it, it feels good. And, and you've chosen to build again with and it. And then we, yeah, our organization said, hey, let's build another cabin. And um, working with Maddie Mead, he's actually on the board of Idaho Base Camp. Um, we looked at all different types of natural building. And uh, Maddie said, hey, we have this new uh, projectile hemp creek blowing apparatus. I don't know what it's called, Maddie. Um, but let's, let's run a workshop around uh, building this cottage and, um, and those that will come up tomorrow will be able to see it. Um, and those that would like to participate in uh, doing a stucco or, or plaster workshop in the spring will be plastering it then too. So Right. Kind of a roundabout answer, but it's, it's nice. They're nice. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. You it's like nice. it. Yeah, it's and people like it when they come by, that you experience kind of the people, mm -hmm. they can feel a difference, right? I think so. I mean, I think so. You know, it's, it's different than a stick frame, you know, uh, building. Great. So, yeah. so back to um, starting with the seed, I think, and then building from there. Tom, can you tell me a little bit about what kind of seed I would need if I wanted to be super DIY and grow my own hemp to build my own house? Sure. Well, and the first thing you should look for is the tag. That One of the biggest issues facing growers of hemp in the U.S. is not following the rules that they would follow, the, the basic rules of, of operating a farm. Who am I sourcing this seed from? What is it going to do? And what sort of information do I need to be prepared to run that? And if you're looking for high industrial biomass acquisition, you better be ready to put a lot up because you're, you're talking about something to the tune of 12 to 14 tons of material per acre being ready to swath. And this is the, the real challenge is once you make that decision, you have to stick with it because if you let that hemp field go to seed set and you don't cut it down prior to, you basically have a bamboo forest on your hands, and you're gonna burn that combine out faster than you would know what to do with it in maybe in the following year, have issues with volunteers, and thus a, a long-term challenge with rotation. So you don't think that like clay, wild, wildflower seed bombs of hemp is a good business for me to go into? <laughs> uh, not, not in the U.S. agricultural market, but I, I'm sure I could find a place in the Southern Hemisphere that would be very excited about so that. So is it true that for hemp building, you know, when you're extracting the inner woody core, which is mm -hmm. what you need to build with, mm -hmm. can you get that from any kind of hemp? You can, but the amount 
of shivs is highly dependent on your crop management system. And just like every other farmer out there is saying in the CBD grain world, where am I gonna sell this? That's really the, the bottleneck at the moment that, that I think is, is maybe the macro. You know, where is the operator who can tell me, these are the specs that you need to hit and I can work back from there to address my field system. Um, and, and that is, is something that, that's quite unique and that we've worked successfully in the CBD and grain side of the business on is pairing out bona fide contract scenarios for growers to feel comfortable in the input cost that they're putting into their production and essentially what makes it bona fide is that the buyer shall purchase that crop so long as these quality assurances are met and we aren't the one validating that. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to work with one of the RMA-backed uh, crop insurance developers, a group called NAU Country, and I go ahead and I say, hey, can you guys take a look at this contract? Because this grower wants to buy seed to fit this contract, and that helps the system work more effectively. And last but certainly not least, with that bona fide aspect, you can go get a real finance deal done with a, a local bank, maybe even possibly an FSA loan once the 18 Farm Bill comes into effect. But that's really the, the sticking point is someone needs to tell us or, or that grower, this is what I need to have as my product to get it ready to run so they manage that field correctly instead of the middle of the season, oh, well, my, someone just left me in the, in the dust, so to say, and now I've still got to find value in that crop or else I'm going to you know, just lose the money I put in it to it today. And is that seed commercially available across the country? Yeah, uh, it depends. So um, someone like John has premier access to Canadian cultivars that are a good initial step for market entry, but there's an imaginary line, and I don't know exactly where it is, but it's somewhere in the northern tip of Wyoming. Below that line, acclimation of Canadian cultivars in particular has been challenging. So when someone in Missouri is looking to source uh, an adequate seed input, that may not be as good of an option. And as you go farther south, there's even larger challenges. Uh, you know, University of Kentucky has some really good work uh, on the challenges of acclimation, but that line is kind of a guiding principle. A lot of access here, starting to get better access below that line. So Tom, I think that's a really good point. Uh, so what we did last year was uh, about 11 different varieties. And so we don't, we did Canadian varieties, we tested European varieties, um, so we were able to really get an understanding of how these varieties are performing, at least in our area. And we have a pretty wide area that we are producing in. Uh, Montana's got 60 million acres, and so what we did was we took various parts of the state and we produced hemp, and we produced lots of it, uh, 5,600 acres. We divided it by 11 different varieties, uh, some European, uh, some Canadian, some domestic, and we saw how each one performed. Um, so that's a very important part of it. Uh, what I think the next part, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit, is the harvesting. Yeah, jump in. That was going to be. And, the next and so one of the things that I think is very important once you know you plant a great seed that is certified, has uh, you know has all the attributes that you may be looking for, then you need to really think about how you're going to harvest this crop if you're growing it. So we've got an integrated model, and what we decided to do initially was uh, handle the complete supply chain. And essentially at American Harvest, we're able to provide seed to our producers, show them how to grow it, uh, and bring all the equipment to harvest it. And we do that, um, and we've done that on purpose because uh, we found when we were getting into this business that much of this technology didn't exist. Or if it existed, people didn't know how to use it. Um, in terms of you know, multi or dual purpose crops, that's what we are primarily focused on. So we are able to get CBD out of our crop. We're able to get the fiber out of our crop and we're able to get grain seed out of our crops. What that allows us to do and actually what I think this allows the industry to do is become more successful. Uh, we are able to use byproducts. So if you grow a crop for fiber only, uh, you have to provide a return to a producer to grow that crop. Sometimes that could be challenging, especially when markets don't exist today for fiber in the way that you know, they may exist in five years from now. So we've got all of these challenges. And, and I think from a harvesting standpoint, we did 1,000 acres on our test last year. 
in 2018. And this year we put 5,600 acres in the ground. Uh, in terms of uh, the equipment needed to handle uh, uh, hemp crops successfully, it's a, a capital intensive, uh, uh, you know, it's a capital intensive crop in terms of harvesting equipment. You don't need the same equipment or same combines that you may be used to. Um, in addition to that, you need a lot more infrastructure. So we, what we took, you know, we took this as a challenge and we put up that infrastructure without having a market. Uh, we did that last year being confident that that market's going to be there, but we first focused on the CBD market. And because the CBD market is today here, uh, extraction is an important part, but we realized that we need a full plant utilization model mm -hmm. right from the beginning, and we have that. So we designed our harvesting system to be able to deal with that. And uh, what that allows us to do, and I think what that would allow the industry to do was, would be to scale business very quickly. And I think, um, going back to some of the points that we talked about earlier, you really need to scale it to bring costs down so people such as yourselves uh, can produce a finished product that would be competitive. Uh, I think that's very important. It'd be great to have uh, you know, a renewable, great crop like hemp, but if it's twice the price of a, a competing crop, it's hard to go mainstream. So what we try to do is look at this as any normal business and what would a normal business need. Uh, but when you start from zero, uh, there's a lot of things that you need. And so from a harvesting standpoint, we, we kind of try to put all of that together. Yeah, I want to come back to the zero waste model. Um, but I wanted to ask Chad, because you're also in equipment. So can you piggyback off of that? Kind of, do you have, what kind of equipment are you selling? So I, I want to ask John one thing. Um, when you're harvesting it, what do you find your best way to get it from the field in and dried? So we've developed a few different ways to do that. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, we, do, we have some special equipment that allows us to maintain the quality of the crop on the field uh, so that it doesn't spoil. Uh, that's mostly for CBD, uh, but for fiber, you don't have that uh, worry. Uh, and so what we were able to do is do that we put in multiple drying systems, not just one, uh, because it's great to say, you know, something's gonna work, but when you've got a brand new industry, it's trial and error. And uh, for two years, we've been trying and we've been erroring. And so we've been uh, fixing those errors, hoping that, you know, we can, we can provide a product that would, that would be a product that uh, manufacturers or con consumers can use. So, uh, you know, when we were looking at the video earlier, or the picture, uh, you saw mold uh, on, on hempcrete. Uh, I think you need standards. I think you need specific ways to harvest uh, that are proven. I think that you can't just go one off and say, I'm gonna harvest a crop. And this year's been uh, very interesting. Uh, we've been able to get most of our crop off. We're not quite done yet, but we will be in the next week or so. Uh, but We've, we're getting calls from across the country about from producers with biomass. And, uh, you know, having a planned approach uh, about, you know, how you're going to harvest is very critical for, for this commodity. Uh, and uh, having infrastructure that you can access that can take that crop and make it into something that's saleable is also very important. If I, I need to jump on that for a second because something that's sellable is a big issue for growers in particular because to John's point about someone who doesn't have a plan to sell their crop, we're getting calls, I've got this, I got seeded on my feminized or my feminized seed lot. I got seeded out. Could I clean that up and you know, would you guys help me sell it? The answer is absolutely not just to make it clear, but that is the challenge is that, that there isn't a market for the product that they think is so valuable, and now they're trying to recoup a portion of that cost by levying that mistake onto another grower. And it, it's a huge problem. We saw it first happen in Colorado, bin seed running of uh, the Yuma crossbows or the workhorse varieties that were ferally, feral hemp strains that were somewhat commercialized. Now the issue, though, is how do you kind of get that out of the way? But the unique thing about the buildings material sector is that even if with the huge growth that we're seeing in the grain market, thanks in large part to the grass status of seed, those shivs are, are there. It's just a question of having 
the availability to readily capture that as a secondary product. So we have processing today on that, uh, but we aren't quite ready to bring that to market. We will be starting in January. Uh, when you're building out large-scale manufacturing facilities, um, they take time. And so we've, we've decided to do it in phases. Uh, so we have the biomass, we have the fiber, uh, we can make herd today, uh, we can make it to a pretty good spec, um, but we, we are planning to do that starting in January. I think we, or we can help, and uh, co companies like us can help, is uh, provide the raw material needed uh, so that uh, we can scale production and, and drive down some of these costs. And what we're looking for is to collaborate. We're looking for ideas and things that people are working on and how uh, what we have in terms of our raw material could help you be successful. And I think if we work together in that fashion, I think the industry grows. I think hempcrete homes uh, become more uh, available across the country. I think you set standards here that allow people and consumers to have confidence in, uh, in when they're buying a hempcrete home or a bioplastic or any of the other things that uh, you know we're going to be making from hemp. Great. Yeah. So can yeah, can I, I was going to ask you a ahead, question. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chad, and then we're oh. going to switch over okay. to okay. more. Well, I, well I, I got a question for oh, those guys. Question, sure. Yeah, it. Tom, you mentioned about the the herd um, and the processing, mm -hmm. John. One of the major loaded questions, I guess, asked a lot, and especially since everybody's growing CBD right now, is can I use that CBD herd for hempcrete? Can I use that CBD herd for uh, working you know, in, in construction and whatnot? And I think my best answer to this point has been so far, the best herd is coming from the fiber plant. The tall ones, the strong, mm -hmm. big, big stalks, no stems coming off, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's consistent and strong. But why couldn't we use the herd from a CBD plant for a different level of hempcrete or a different level of material? I mean, my example I, I tell people is you have freshly squeezed Florida orange juice, which is grade A, mm -hmm. you know, industrial fiber hemp herd. Sure. But then you get, you know, tang or you know, these other Maybe you guys don't remember Tang. <laughs> but you, you get you know, a lower level of orange juice. Why couldn't the CBD plant herd be used for something like that? Because it, it's right now, I know of yeah. farms are piling it up. So I, I'm, I'll say this. I think that there's a lot of opportunity to look into all of that. Uh, since it's new and we haven't done it, right? So I think this is where the collaboration comes into play. I think that um, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't, but I think we need to prove that out, how successful it's gonna be compared yeah. to what's, what, you know, what, what we're using in terms of the herd. And uh, I was, compared to I was talking with uh, Sergi outside, sorry if I butchered your name. Sergey. Um, Sergey, yes, thank you. Um, and he was explaining that to me and he said with uh, you know, the CBD fiber, it's more compact and brittle and rough where uh, the hemp fiber herd is more porous and you know you can kind of indent it so it breathes a little better. So ideally, fiber would be the best thing to use on that side, but you could use the CBD herd as well. It just takes a little more mixing. And so for example, spent biomass is an important area where we're looking and we're doing quite a bit of work in that, in that area. And so we've identified a few things that we want to be able to do with that. Uh, again, I think all these things are going to come, but uh, we may not be there today um, because uh, really think about it, uh, we just have a, a farm bill that's passed in December 2018. Uh, when, you're putting, when you're putting infrastructure up, it takes time. We were fortunate that we had the ability to start two years ago because Montana had a pilot program, so we set up our infrastructure uh, over the last two years and we built it out uh, where, you know, so today we're producing and we are shipping product out the door. Uh, and we haven't done that with fiber, but we've done all the pilots now to be able to feel comfortable that starting in January 2020 that we'd be able to ship that out. Uh, then we can, once we start doing that, I think that's the first step. Um, I think you want to get there first and then you look at yeah. these opportunities. And I, I want to be clear also from an architect's point of view, is 
we're beginning an industry. We're starting from scratch, even though Europe's been way ahead of us. And after that question of CBD herd versus industrial fiber herd, what I tell people is you are starting and showing the world, the United States, a new building material. And we have to, as builders, architects, engineers, interior designers, fabric people, everybody, we have to build the best we can right now because we cannot afford any mm -hmm. mistakes that could, could undermine us Absolutely. As, as it starts. And the discussion of the CBD herd and why I brought it up is I want to emphasize to all of us that while you're building in the early stages, do the best you can, use the best materials, and as John said, we'll worry about the CBD herd later on. We'll find a use for it. Don't, don't worry, we will. But right now, we have to have the best quality, best material. I think you gotta walk, then jog, and then run. And I oh, think yeah, that, yeah. that's exactly where we are in the industry. So I think you have to work with what we can provide today on a little bit of a scale, keep you know, quality under control in terms of how we need to get that to market. I think if we can perfect that at stage one, I think we've done our job, and then we can build on that for the next year. And now the time is, uh, it's very crucial because even in the CBD market, people have squandered that market already. There's uh, testing facilities that are helping regulate how the company views CBD and they're testing, and they're not finding CBD in CBD products. They're finding toxins, they're finding a lot of melatonin, and melatonin will make you tired, so you're like, oh, it's working. But they've already scammed people, and there's, there's farmers being taken, there's a lot of people are being taken, and with this conference, this industry, we can do it different, but there's gonna be the people that think, are gonna try and make a quick buck. I think it's important to, to there's a parallel that's important. That is gas station CBD, and the worst thing for <laughs> This discussion is to let that, or this side of the industry, so to say, is to let the equivalency of gas station CBD leak into the building sector. Because exactly. it's never, it's, it's, it would actually probably be more of a detriment in the long run just for the industry's growth. But I think there is a very concise corrective action, mm -hmm. uh, not, not so immediately following the release of the rules that a lot of people are gonna be not so surprised by given what's happening out there in the market right yep. now. And so Tom, I think regulation's very important and it applies in CBD and it applies in fiber. It applies in food. I, I think uh, you know, the, the, the discussions we've had today kind of indicate that. It was really good uh, with Parsons and what we were hearing about you know, just the building materials and how do you know what's in your house today and so we don't really test it. And, and so I think some level of uh, information is important. And I think you know, we need to test that and, and bring products that are safe and are able to become mainstream. Um, I'd like to get back to the house portion of it a little bit. So Bob, can you talk to me a little bit about, um, as an architect, you know, maybe the versatility of the material and when you would recommend it to a client and also maybe touch a little bit on how we can increase client demand. I know that's a lot, but when I, when I was building, it was the thing that I was most frustrated yeah. with is that I thought by, I'm a young girl in the trades and I'm gonna get all of these people to build with hempcrete and then really as a builder, they already have a plan when you get that job. And so I'm really interested in how we can increase consumer demand so that they come to you and your cohorts and say, I want hempcrete. And you're maybe an architect who says, I've never heard of that, what is that? Right, right, you know right, what I mean? I'd yeah. love to get to that place. Okay, I, I think there were three questions, so yeah, I, I, I remember the first one. And that, that's versatility. Yes. And I don't think anybody knows the answer to that because it's, it is so versatile and we don't know where it's gonna go. We know that we're using it to build buildings as insulation, as a wall structure, monolithic wall structure. But we also know it could be a battery. We also know it can be a, a filter. We also know that it can, it, just imagine it as a, a filter, it absorbs a city, I'm exaggerating, but a city built of concrete structures 
is absorbing all the carbon. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the research is coming out now that um, hempcrete can be a, a battery. I mean, it's a battery, <laughs> okay? So you don't have, you have energy, you have filter, and you have shelter in one building. So the versatility is endless. But and we're just touching versatility of design as well as what I was speaking to. So um, if I'm just coming to you because I want to build a custom home, then yep. I can have it look. I, I, I took that tangent because it gets to this. Because one of the th reasons I went out to Colorado to learn about this was I wanted to bring it back to the Northeast. Okay, um, Colorado, the West, California, Idaho. The hempcrete buildings are wonderful. It's been built by a cottage industry of people that have been doing this for a good 20, 30 years, and especially in Europe. These guys are you know, incredible. But, but it's, I wanted to bring something, and the way I put it is I'm, I want to explore the aesthetics of hempcrete. You know, how can I bring a stucco igloo to Dorset, Vermont? Yeah, it wouldn't work. How can, how, can, how can I bring a material like this and work it so that it can fit into a historic district or into a New England type of environment? But then also in Florida, why couldn't it work on the coast? But there's Florida-style architecture, there's Texas-style architecture, there's federal, you know, it's endless. So um, the versatility is endless, but we have to know the mix. And, we have to know how strong it'll be. And these things are coming. These things are coming. And I'm hoping that with what we've started here with you guys and the US Hemp Building Association that we're gonna have a bunch of really good experts. I take that back. Right. Nobody's an expert. <laughs> we're gonna have some people that are gonna wanna learn and know where to explore so that five years from now, 10 years from now, and even 20, we, we have to think of this as you know, to infinity. Um, where can we explore it? Because it's, it's gonna change the construction industry. Well, I was gonna ask you one question on that. Mm -hmm. What do you think of prefabricated, prefab homes that are made from hemp? I think they're great. I, I think it's the only way that, uh, prefab means many things. I think the best way to do this in construction is gonna be through block or panel. Uh, what we were talking about, the bucket brigade, and I mean that in a loving way, not in anything negative, but the way we built Eric's building and the way a lot of the buildings are built now is the camp and the mix and tamp, mix and tamp, and it's labor intensive. It's really labor intensive. It's almost like cob. Yeah, yeah, and it's also, um, you know, you can't, it's, it's uneven, okay? Um, doing it in a factory with prefab as panels or in blocks, I think is where that's got to go. And if I could expand on that for a second, because one of the, the really interesting things about the impending impacts of the Farm Bill is that it lists hemp as part of the Critical Agricultural Materials Act. And for anyone who, who's in the building side in a more conventional sense, that's a huge wake-up call for them because it means that dollars to match uh, basic research on what makes the best binder. How can we get a prefab, or, or mm -hmm. what that means to you, it may be different to me. How can we help instigate that at a higher level than what's been available in Europe to date? But more importantly, part of the reasoning behind why it was listed is the wildfires here in the West. How can you rapidly deploy new, pre, some, to some degree, prefab homes in the event of a fire or have a home that could actually maybe make it through. I know Sergey has done some really interesting things in trying to burn some stuff down with hempcrete in the state of California, but um, you know that that is a, a try and, and telling way of how we can help tell the story of why this is so valuable, mm -hmm. especially right now, mm -hmm. uh, given the the greater farm crisis that, that's happening in this country. So I can I can jump back to equipment. I know we kind of got sidetracked, but I was asking how you harvested because uh, that's a big bottleneck is getting it from the field dry into a processing state. And um, we have people trying to, uh, a lot of the success is drying in the field to getting it down. 
And you said you have two dryers, which is fantastic because I've been working with customers who have one dryer and they want to pre-grind, fine grind <clears throat> their material to get it to a certain point. So interesting things is that we've been, you know, trial and error, like I said, is a, an amazing thing. Um, you learn the hard way. And so drying is some, you know, we could work sometimes without drying. So that's mm -hmm. something that we've developed. Uh, but in terms of all of these equipments or any, all of these processes, I think, you know, as we go forward over the next couple of years, it's going to become more standardized. And I think everybody's going to learn how a certain way works better than the other way. It doesn't mean everything doesn't work, it just means there may be some more ways that work better. Right. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, where the industry's at when you're setting up these facilities and, and processing equipment, um, you have to try it. And, and so, you know, we've tried, you know, along the lines, we've invested a lot of money uh, in terms of equipment. And so, you know, we, the purpose of that was one, to have uh, a capability to provide several different things to our customers. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to learn uh, what works better and how we could improve that. So it's kind of what we've done. Well, what may work better is stopping and thinking about maybe there's a problem with, and I know this may be controversial, mechanical decortication in a field reading s system. What? Meaning that you know when you swath a row of hemp down and you lay it and you bring it back and forth and then you bale it and then you run it through a mechanical decorticator, which is what is presently available. I mean, what I think is, is more interesting um, that, or wet redding that isn't as environmentally damaging is something of interest to some really top-notch entities here in the U.S. But then the, the other, and, and be careful with this one, is microbial decortication, which a byproduct of that is methane. So you're basically building small bombs, but if you knew a way to utilize that methane, you have very nice, beautiful long fibers and separated herd concurrently. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of microbes that love to eat the lignin that binds those two. But right now, everyone's like, how can I improve on mechanical decortication as if that's the end all be all? <laughs> and I would, if there's anyone out there who's got a micro bath that they want to talk about, come find me later. Uh, <laughs> Well, that, was, that brings up an interesting question, and I don't know that we're the panel to address this, but when I was kind of going out and networking earlier, seeing if anyone had any pressing questions, someone asked me about, um, I think it was Bill, Bill, you out there? Hey, Bill. Um, so, hey, Bill. So we were talking about how, you know, hemp is commonly known to leach toxins out of the soil, right? It's, it aerates the soil, it's a great rotating crop, and um, he was asking me, or we were discussing how, what happens to those toxins, those pesticides from cotton, you know, all of these metals that we're leaching into the plant. Are we then breathing that in, in our permeable wall structures that we're so proud of? It depends, right? And I would, if anyone wants some really great research on this, uh, Penn State just put out a great article about uh, areas within the leaf tissue that, that showed higher uh, percentages of heavy metal toxicity in areas that they knowingly went into Superfund sites, planted hemp, and then looked at the leaf tissue specifically. Uh, but that's, there's also a good side to that. Uh, a lot in, in Colorado, we have huge issues with silicon in the waterways. If you could find a way to remediate that silicon, save money for downstream water treatment centers, it, it's a gold mine in and of itself, but having higher silicon content is a precursor for the, the future of industrial plastics that are sourced from hemp. Uh, so it depends on where and what you want to do, uh, but in other instances, when you just want to get it out, maybe that's just the value in and of itself is getting it out of the ground and not necessarily turning that crop product into an industrial product. Uh, and maybe the year following, you have a, a clean crop. So, mm -hmm. so I think that uh, these are the things that you have. Th that's how I think you need to think about it. And I don't think there's a clear answer today. Um, well, doesn't that, that the lime kind of, whenever it hardens and calcifies, doesn't it kind of trap those things in there? So you wouldn't be, because it's coating each individual herd in the lime and binder solution. I think this we is may not know, but this is why we're all here, right? <laughs> yeah. This is really fascinating. It is.